And South Africa buckles under ESCOM's failures uh, our potential to generate 901 gigawatts from offshore wind. Much of it from the Western Cape has been mooted as a possible solution to the ongoing energy uh, security crisis uh, that we're experiencing. We've seen data from the World Bank and its offshore wind roadmap for South Africa released following the Green Energy Africa Summit last year. And it shows lots of technical potential for fixed and floating offshore wind in the country. We've got towns like Saldana, Cape Town, Hermanus, Mossel Bay, all highlighted as having great potential for offshore wind projects. And that uh, World Bank study, in theory, would give the country enough power to power ourselves 30 times over if uh, all turbines operated at full capacity. So that's quite something of a dripping roast. But that's obviously made up of largely floating wind turbines, which are better suited to deeper waters, but also includes pockets of opportunity for fixed turbines as well. The thing is, offshore wind farms are costlier to build than onshore ones, but they do tend to operate at significantly higher capacity factors, often well above 50%, meaning that they can deliver more electricity every year. We've seen big growth over in Europe and the International Energy Agency expecting global annual offshore to reach uh, 30 gigawatts by 2027. Now, if we are to develop an offshore wind industry, it could be an opportunity clearly for um, local uh, industrialization. Uh, but there are still many challenges to overcome. So before we leap into the ocean to solve our energy crisis, we thought uh, it best to gather the experts around the table to talk about what the costs are, operational uh, regulatory challenges and the potential opportunities that you need to know about. And that's what we're going to try and address during the course of uh, this webinar on offshore wind. Is it just hot air or is there something more there? If we take a step back uh, and we think about onshore wind, um, the attendees on this call, on this webinar, will know very well we deal with land leases, uh, and Jill's going to get into the technical aspects of that later. But um, you know, the first question people say to me, well, how do we lease the sea? Um, we're very fortunate um, to think about this in in a number of ways. We've got what James mentioned as uh, offshore wind, but with fixed or floating. And I think if we think about the most difficult first, this floating infrastructure. Uh, it is going to in involve incredible legal hoops to jump through. But those are not legal hoops that we haven't all thought about before. So, yes, it's complicated, but I think we need to think about ourselves as having solved some of these problems. Um, we all are looking at hydrogen projects. Uh, these are complicated integrated projects. Um, they involve complicated environmental considerations, complicated leasing infrastructure, and they're definitely look at an integrated and a non-integrated structure. We also have done offshore oil and gas projects, um, and those also similarly involve, involve a floating um, oil rig, um, and the same considerations apply. We've also done CECOM and telecommunications cables, and so when James talks about floating substations and we all have our minds boggle, we've solved those problems too because we've done undersea sea cables. So it is complicated from a legal um, regulatory landscape, but these are problems that we have navigated and would be able to navigate um, if we looked at offshore wind, especially in the floating sense. The one other legal and regulatory consideration is, well, who's going to procure this? Who is going to actually say, I want to do an offshore wind project? Um, those of us that come from the government renewables program automatically think, well, you know, you mentioned how many million gigawatts we can solve the problem, South Africa's problems with this. Is it going to be government in ESKIM? And we have to look at the IRP in order to understand if it is going to be government in ESKIM. We're all sitting on the edge of our seats waiting for IRP 2023 to come out to understand if that's going to be part of our energy mix. Um, so we don't know the answer to that question. It's not in IRP 2019. Um, so as far as we know, Maybe let's let's see what Mantashe has in store for us. Um, but the other option is a bilateral arrangement. Um, and the bilateral arrangement would involve a private sector player, possibly in a port, possibly being a big hydrogen player that needs to power its electrolyzers, who can sign a direct agreement uh, for that offshore wind power. And that starts to sound really interesting because we move from the realm of the um, possible into the realm of the doable. So I think... Uh, we need to be a little bit more pointed about who is going to buy the sort of energy. And when we start to talk about potential hydrogen offtake, that suddenly starts sounding interesting and viable.